we saw decision trees for the first time in the very first lecture. And we've seen them a few times since, but we never actually discussed how to train them. In this lecture, we will address that problem. Decision trees by themselves are not a very popular model in machine learning. They are quick to train, but they can be prone to overfitting and regularizing them hurts performance a lot. The main settings in which trees are used these days are in ensembles, a model that combines a lot of other models in order to arrive at a prediction. Specifically, the method of gradient boosted decision trees is a very popular approach for achieving high performance with relatively little effort. In this lecture, we will build this picture up step by step. We will first discuss decision and regression trees in the first two videos, and then different ways to create model ensembles in the last two videos. Decision trees in their very simplest form work only on data with categorical features. We'll use this data set as a running example. Each instance is a movie represented by three features, its rating, its genre, and the aspect ratio in which it was filmed. And the target class is to predict whether a movie won an Oscar, was merely nominated for an Oscar, or was overlooked entirely. Here's what a trained decision tree for this data set might look like. This is what a trained decision tree on this data might look like. Each internal node asks the value of a particular feature and sends the instance to one of its children depending on the value of that feature. The leaf nodes, the nodes of the tree with no further children, indicated with circles, are labeled with classes. If we are given a particular instance, in this case a movie, and we want to know what its class is according to this tree, we start at the root node. This asks us what the genre of the movie is. In this case, the genre is drama, so we are sent to the middle child. That's another internal node which asks what the aspect ratio is. In this case, 239, so we are sent to the rightmost child. This child is a leaf node, which has a class label, in this case, 1. So we predict that this particular movie won an Oscar. So that's how a given tree classifies an instance. Now the question is, given a data set, how do we find a tree that fits that data well? This is how the standard algorithm is set up. It's sometimes called ID3, sometimes C45, depending on minor differences, which don't matter too much for our purposes. We start with an empty tree containing no nodes, and we add one node at a time. We don't backtrack, so once a node is added, it stays in the tree, and we simply keep adding nodes until we can add no more. The node that we add at any given moment, the next split we create in the data, in other words, is the node that creates the least uniform distribution on the classes after we split. We'll look at an example to see how this works. Like I said, we start with an empty tree. So the first choice we have to make is to choose a feature to split on in the root node. And here we've plotted our data for two features. We ignore the third for a moment. Each letter in this table represents the class label of one of our instances. And we've separated them by the values of the features rating and genre. For instance, there are five movies with the rating G and the genre romance. Three of those have the class overlooked. One of them has the class nominated and one of them has the class one. Before we apply this node, our class distribution consists of 23 movies that were overlooked. 12 movies that were nominated, and 11 movies that won. And this is our entire data set. If we split this set of movies by the feature rating, we are partitioning our data set into three subsets, corresponding to the rows of the matrix on the right. If we tally up the proportions of each class in these three subsets, we see that the class distributions after the split are not so different from the class distribution before the split. In general, the proportion of overlooked to nominated to one is roughly the same in all three and the same as it was before the split. In other words, after we learn the value of the rating, we don't learn that much more about the class distribution. This tells us that at this point in our classification, the rating is not a very informative feature to split on. By contrast, if we look at genre, that corresponds to separating our data by the columns of the table on the right. This time, we see that the class distributions after splitting are much more different than they were before. For instance, 
knowing that a movie has the genre sci-fi, allows us to say with near certainty that it won't win an Oscar. So let's say we decide to split on genre. This gives us a tree with one internal node and three leaf nodes. The next step is to extend the tree, to take one of these leaf nodes and replace it by another split on another feature. In this case, since we've ignored our third feature, rating is the only feature left. And if we split by genre and then by rating, we get this segmentation of the instance space. Each of these regions, corresponding to a leaf node in our tree, is called a segment. A segment is a part of our instance space within which our classifier treats all the instances the same, in this case, assigning them the same class. There are a few things worth noting. First, note that we choose a separate split for every single node we extend. So for each of the three children of the genre node, we may choose a different feature to split on. If the genre is romance, the next split may be rating, whereas if the genre is drama, the next split may be aspect ratio. The second thing to note is that with there is no use in splitting on a feature that you've split on before. Every instance that encounters the lower genre node in this diagram will have the genre romance, so we end up not splitting the data at all. So no instances will end up in the rightmost two leaf nodes under the second genre node. So with these considerations in mind, we can simply take a tree and keep adding splits to the leaf nodes in the tree, extending the tree to grow larger and larger. Of course, we need some stop conditions to stop our tree from growing infinitely large. And the following are the reasons for not splitting a leaf node any further. First, we may set a global maximum depth. This is a hyperparameter that can help in stopping the model from overfitting. If we've reached the maximum depth, we can simply output the majority class in that segment according to the training data. Second, when all feature values at a particular leaf node are the same, then we know that splitting any further will not tell us anything more because whatever we split on, all of the instances in our current segment will end up in one of the children after the split. In this case, again, we can label the leaf node with the majority class in our current segment. And third, we may see a leaf node where all class values are the same. In this case, there is nothing more to learn, and we label the segment of this leaf node with that particular class. Now, our criterion to choose the next feature to split on for a given leaf node was uniformity. The less uniform the distribution after the split, the more we prefer that feature. In order to make that more precise, we need to define uniformity. So how do we measure the non-uniformity of a distribution? If we have two classes, it's straightforward to do. The further we are from a 50-50 split, the less uniform the distribution. But for more than two classes, it's not so clear cut. Here we see two distributions. And in the first, the proportion of the red class is bigger than in the second. But in the second, the remainder is divided up between blue and orange in a more uniform way. So how do we know which of these two distributions gives us more information about which of the three classes is most likely. One very useful principle we've seen before is the entropy, which we introduced in the fifth lecture. And the conclusion there was that the more uniform our distribution, the more unsure we are, the higher the entropy. In the distribution on the left, the best code we can come up with gives us an expected code length of two bits, which is therefore the entropy of the distribution. In the distribution on the right, we know that A is more likely than B, which is more likely than C and D. And we can use that information to design a more efficient code. And the best code we can come up with for expected code length gives us 1.75 bits, which is therefore the entropy of this distribution. In short, the lower the entropy, the more information we have about the outcome of a distribution, and the more we prefer it, and the more we therefore prefer that distribution for one of the nodes in our decision tree. So we can now use entropy to establish how uneven a particular class distribution is, and the more uneven, the better we like the split. But to evaluate this split here, we need to look at four different distributions. There's three distributions after the split, and one before. Remember, we are evaluating all possible splits over the whole tree, so the incoming distribution may differ between candidates. 
To apply this principle to the multiple children that a split creates, we can use conditional entropy. Conditional entropy is just the entropy of a conditional distribution, summed over all values of the conditional weighted by the marginal probability of that value. So for example, we might look at the probability that the class or the outcome in our dataset is 1, given that the genre is drama. A distribution on the class, conditional on one of the features. If we pick a particular value for the conditional feature, in this case drama, then we can look at the distribution on the outcome. This gives us an entropy. And since we've instantiated the conditional with a fixed value, it's just a regular entropy, where it so happens that the probabilities are conditionals. If we now take this regular entropy, conditioned on the value of the genre, and we take the expectation with respect to that genre, we get the conditional entropy. So for the conditional entropy, both of the random variables, outcome and genre, are uninstantiated. And if we write out the entropy, we see that it's simply a weighted sum over the instantiated entropies. And this is what we call the conditional entropy. With this, we can define the information gain of a particular feature. It's defined as the entropy before we made the split minus the conditional entropy after we make the split. In other words, we want to see how much a particular split, in this case the split on genre, decreases the entropy of O. That is, how much it increases how much we know about O. In practice, that works like this. We define an incoming set of instances before the split, called S, and we compute its entropy. And when we compute the entropy of a set like this based on its class frequencies, we just use relative frequencies to estimate the probabilities. So for instance, the probability of the red class in S is estimated as 23, 23 over 23 plus 12 plus 11. After the split, we get three subsets of instances, SR, SD, and SS. And each of these have different class distributions for which we can also compute the entropies. Putting all this together gives us this formula for the information gain of a particular feature. The entropy of the set of instances before the split minus the weighted sum over the entropies of the sets of instances after the split. So here's the algorithm again, written out more precisely. We start with a single unlabeled leaf node, and then we enter a loop, which halts until there are no unlabeled leaf nodes left. Within that loop, we look at all the leaf nodes we currently have, and for each we look at the segment. If one of the stop conditions applies to that leaf node L, we label it with the majority class of S. And if not, we split the leaf on whatever feature F at that point gives us the highest information gain. And we simply keep splitting until there are no unlabeled leaves left. This is the basic algorithm for constructing a decision tree. In the next video, we'll look at some of the variations and details. We'll look at what to do if some of your features are numeric. We'll look at what to do if your target value is numeric. And finally, we'll look at some of the ways you can combat overfitting if you're trying to train a single decision tree.